Welcome to the conversation. My name is John Hattie from the University of Melbourne and I have here today Pazi Salzberg from the Ministry of Education in Finland. And it's certainly exciting to have you here and we look to your country all the time. What's it like to be in the top five of the educational league's tables? You know, most Finnish people don't think like this. We don't know unless you remind us that we are there, that most people don't really care about where, where we are. But I think it's um, like always when you're on the top of the hill, it's windy, uh, it's busy. Um, uh, and in a way, it's not a comfortable place to be because, uh, you know, it's easier. In Finland, we say that it's easier to ski behind somebody else when you have the track, you know where to go. But if you're the first one, you don't see anything, just snow and white. And we have been in this type of situation where we have, we have to choose the direction where to go. People are asking this question. So I would much rather be number five than number one. So in terms of what we want to do here in Australia, and our Prime Minister has aspirations to be in the top five, um, so being number five is better than being number one, but being number five, any sense of what we need to do here? Now, this is the horrifically large question, but given your experience of what you've done in Finland, and we want to get there soon, we're not going to wait 30 or 40 years, so yeah. what would you say to us? When I read the, uh, the Prime Minister's uh, goal, which is a kind of a... Uh, ambitious goal to, to have as a not literally to be number five but it's a, it's a kind of a almost like a metaphor that you yes. want to you want to improve so it doesn't matter whether you're number five or number eight or number sure. three it's it's a it's a kind of a call for improvement as I see Australia all the states Australia as a federal country or, or the states here I, I think you, you are doing pretty well that you are already on the uh, on the map of the the world's best education system. So I, I, I don't see this as a situation like in many other countries where you have a long, much longer way to go. Uh, so many of the basic, basic issues are in place here. But to get that sense though, like when you go to countries like a 20th and 30th, and like we're more like 10th and 12th, um, often I think the mood in Australia is that we're like we're 20th or 30th. It sounds like there's, there's a crisis going on because we're not in the top five. What I hear here is much more a kind of a um, very pessimistic, critical yeah. views on what you're doing. And as an ex uh, external observer, and I, I really see, I've seen most of the OECD countries up close, I can, I can say that things are much better here, mm. uh, just here and in, in New Zealand, when I, when I meet with principals and teachers. But I think, of, of course, there are things that you need to do. And I, I think you are in, in much better situation here in Australia today than most countries 10 years ago, when we didn't, didn't have this experience and evidence from, uh, from PISA and other things. Uh, so you can you can really if you take a close look at what the well-performing countries have done and what the countries who have been able to climb up in this educational performance uh, pyramid, uh, you have much more uh, choices to make. Mm. Um, I, I think some, some of the things that you are already considering here include how how do you spend the money, how do you fund your education system. I think a very important question is also what do you do with your teachers? How would you how should you prepare them? Uh, uh, how should we provide them more professional development, leadership issue? And then finally, I think one of the critical questions here is um, if you compare Australia to um, the other high-performing education systems, is the question of equity. What do you, what do you mean by... Just, let's go back through those. Mm. On funding, we actually spend more funding per student than you do in Finland by a long way. Uh, you, you do, um, if you use the... The current statistics, you spend a little bit more than little Finland, more, okay. but this is, I think this is because of your massive uh, f uh, funding for structures. The uh, building education ex revolution. Exactly. Yes. You know, if you take that away and you compare what Aust Australia was spending three years ago, you, you, have, a, you have a significant gap between Finland and uh, Australia in favour of Finland, so we have been spending more. So, okay. In terms of teacher quality, now that's the catch-all all the time because mm -hmm. The message that often comes through from that is that the teachers need to improve. They're not good. What have you done in Finland on teacher quality? Well, we decided already when, when we started to build the current education system 40 years ago, exactly 40 years ago today, we realized that if you have a system that is aiming at to be not number one, but we be equitable so that every child will be having um, opportunity and, and pathway to, to uh, be successful, that it requires teachers that are better educated. And, and better education not only by some teachers, but everybody, all of them. So and certainly at the beginning, they have to be at least a master's to get in. Uh, yeah, you know, many other countries had probably done a different way, but in Finland we decided that it's a primary Early childhood development and, and, and primary teachers, preschool teachers and primary teachers are the key. And that's why we require that they will have an academic 
higher uh, degree uh, before they can But teach. once they're in, how do you then keep their education, their professional development going? Because we spend an enormous amount of money on that. On professional oh, development, yes. yeah. Well, you know, education is very decentralized in Finland. So it's very much up to the school, individual teachers, municipalities who are running the schools to make sure that teachers who are in service there have access to uh, professional development. But I would say that this kind of a systematic way of focusing on highly trained teachers and, and building a profession during the course of the last 30, 35 years has created a system where become a primary school teacher is a very high demand mm. in, in Finland because many young people when they look at the, what the primary school teachers do with their mm. Uh, high quality academic master's degrees that they earn in our universities, they see pretty much what the medical doctors or lawyers or engineers or anybody else with a similar degree are doing with their kind of autonomy, independence, respect, professional, uh, kind of a collective nature of work. And that's why I think they are going there, not only because the university degree is a kind of a competitive right. degree, but they, the kind of a, the image of being a primary school teacher is, uh, I think, is pretty close to what you would how you do you describe Absolutely. the medical doctor's work? And so the temptation then is for me to say that the way that we could do that and, and improve things and to make sure our money is spent well is tie it to the performance of children mm. and look at the whole test accountability notions to make sure we're spending the money the right way. Mm. Well, this is your way to think about these things. And the, 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 the culture in this, this respect is, is very different in Finland, as I see this. I think we are put, putting much more emphasis in Finland on well-being, happiness, uh, kind of a health of children, so that everybody's uh, healthy and you know, ready to develop themselves and take the responsibility of their own learning. I think what, what, what I hear from foreign visitors to Finland, and we have a massive number of people coming, many of them, they are surprised to see how much responsibility of learning in Finland, in Finnish schools is with the pupils. Yes. Yeah? So they, they are driving the learning and development, not the teachers. Yeah. And I think if you have this type of system where the responsibility of learning and development is primarily with the learners themselves, yeah. you cannot rely on numbers yeah. and testing. Of course we do that as well, but I think the difference between our countries is that in Finland we are, tend to rely much more on the numbers, the assessments and tests that are made by teachers and schools yeah. and trust that the numbers that they show are real. Okay? And you've got a nice <coughs> index of that, such as PISA. And so what you're telling me is that you're losing, using a lot more about the student assessment capabilities of the students rather than inflicting tests as we tend to try and do. Absolutely. And I think, you know, if you, if you use the English terms like assessment for learning, which is not at all a Finnish invention, so we are relying on the research and, and ideas from Australia, from England, United States in this respect. But I, I think, for example, this assessment, student assessment for learning is something that we have, we have, ca we have called the kind of an international idea and put it in a practice in our schools, like we have done with many other innovations in Finland. There, there are very few Finnish, original Finnish ideas in, in the pedagogy and teaching well, and what we do. So, it's not completely you know, true. The words uh, respect, responsibility, trust, Certainly, have come out of the Finnish system yeah, yeah, very but, strongly. Uh, sure, but I'm, I'm talking about the if you look at the uh, educational literature yeah. of the pedagogy or teaching methods or sure. assessment ideas, the very few of them initially come from Finland. So what I'm saying is that we, you know, our skill is not to invent. Our skill is to implement and understand sure. what what ideas. But if work I'm listening in. to you now and I'm saying, well, how would I interpret it in Australia? Then I come up with my magic word, the word that's used all the time: autonomy. We mm, give the teachers mm. autonomy. We give the schools right, autonomy. Right. Um, and that comes then with choice, and parents should have choice, etc. In your high schools in Finland, do the parents get a lot of choice in terms of the kind of schools they can send them to? Do the students get a lot of choice about the kind of subjects? How early is that choice? What we have done in Finland is that we have kind of a delayed the parental choice to upper secondary school, which is when our kids are about 16 years of age. And it, when you have a 16-year-old Finn, very few parents anymore have anything to say about their choice because this is this is the the end of the the compulsory education. So, you know, together with this re responsibility of uh, for to be uh, responsible for their own learning, they also have responsibility and freedom to choose where they want to go. So we have the first time when parents really can choose or students can choose uh, between one school and another comes at the age of sixteen. Right. And I think this is this is one of the things that I think 
I can, I can see in many other high-performing countries that they are kind of are trying to postpone and delay the parental choice as late as possible. And, and all of those... But we have a big choice here, the whole debate about private and public mm, and choosing mm, schools mm. and the, 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 the religious schools that can choose from. Right. We stream the kids in right. terms of how we right. do them. There's a lot of streaming in Finland high schools? No, high schools, sure, yes. We have a, two different, uh, very different types of high school, uh, upper secondary school options, vocational school and general school, they lead to very that's, different... That's kids. before 16? Uh, at the age of 16. At the age of 16, yeah. but before no, not 16? Be, not before that, there's nothing. No, so there's the, a lot of So, that, yeah. you, you know, this, this is the main idea of Finnish education. Yeah. We try to keep children in a similar school all the way until up uh, the, they're 16 and, and leave the compulsory school. And, and this is what many, actually, all of the high-performing countries are doing, trying to do the same, that they are not really opening education to the free market type of choice before the... Right the students sit in a piece. And it's quite yeah. different here. Yeah, and you know, if you if you want to be, if you, if you technically just like, you know, would like to build a strategy to be high in the PISA rankings, this is one thing that you should consider, to try to manage and delay the parental choice to later stage that will improve equity and enhance the quality. But of course, it's never simple like this. And that's <coughs> the other question I want to ask you, equity. Mm. Like Australia is reasonably high performing, but not so high on equity. And the notion, you, what I'm hearing you saying here, is that one way is to delay the, the, those kind of choices to at least mm, 16 mm, or so mm, on. Mm. Any other issues on equity? Now, you must have low socioeconomic schools. Do no, they do. Yeah, have the dramatic yeah, difference yeah. like they do in this country? Yeah. Australia is doing a little bit better than the OECD countries on average yes. in equity. So if we organize countries, rank order them in terms of equity, Australia is well, doing better. Than, Finland. You, you, you are, yeah, but all the Scandinavian countries are very strong in equity and that's why it's not only the school issue it's also the we have to particularly with the equity issue we have to look at many other things like what the health system and social protection and um, early childhood development things are doing but I, I think one thing that is probably standing taller than anything else in Finland in terms of this is is the um, how we understand and organize special education the education for children with the special needs and, and that's special a, needs, yeah. yeah that's a different system different way to uh, do this thing than here and many other countries because we have we probably have much more sensitive lens through which we are looking at our classrooms and students and that's why we have many more students who are uh, categorized as special needs students like for example what you have here so we in other Can words you separate them out or the no same no it's no it's an inclusive it's, it's inclusive, an inclusive yeah. principle but this means that we have also many more individuals in our basic school system, one to grade one to nine system, who are receiving individualized support and help. And they normally receive it early on rather than when the problems are already there. So if, if, I, if I had to you know, pick up one thing that Finland is doing particularly systematically and well to enhance equity, it is the special education system. It's a very pricey, it's very expensive, but when we, when we do our economics of education, we also calculate that the, the cost of not doing that would be much higher later on. So that's why we want to invest early on and make sure that everybody is treated as an individual and will re receive the basic support and help and then try to make sure that everybody can succeed. So the obvious question from that is that you therefore have very low class sizes. No, we don't. Well, internationally, if you, if, you, if you walk into a urban classroom in primary school today, you would probably see the same number of kids that you would see here. We are internationally very very similar in this respect. So in terms of what I'm hearing that we should think about here in Australia is is worry about the giving more of the responsibility and the trust to the teachers and um, as a consequence looking at the equity issues of health, well-being as well as academic outcomes and make mm -hmm. teachers responsible for that. Mm -hmm. But what I'm not quite understanding is how do we know as taxpayers that we're getting our return? From your school system? Yeah. yeah. Because like, we know, I'm, I've been a kid through schools, not every teacher's perfect. How, how are you going to make sure that we do make sure these desirable things are in place? One thing that we are doing, I'm not saying that you, you, you could do this right away or you should do this at all, is that we are relying on schools as communities to report these things back to the communities and parents. Right. Uh, uh, this is one thing. Then the other thing is that, of course, the, the, the over, overall idea of leadership, the localized, kind of a, kind of a community-based education that we have. Finland doesn't have a kind of a centralized system where the government is running the things. It's all within our communities. And parents are, of course, very responsible much... Responsible to the community. Uh, yeah. yeah. In Finland, if we want to know how things are going, uh, 
we do exactly what the OECD is doing when it wants to know how the countries are doing, that we are taking samples of schools and pupils and teachers and we are measuring and assessing and uh, evaluating them just like any other research would do. And, you know, this probably because of this trust that we have in our system, this seems to be enough to convince politicians, um, uh, authorities, parents, business community that, that the things are going well. Of course, we have bad teachers or poor teachers who are not performing to the level that they should in Finland, like every country has. But we don't think that just by collecting numbers of every single classroom and school, you can you can and the community uh, can speak. Yeah, yeah. So I think Finland is probably a little bit different in this way that we have we have a very strong sense of kind of a collective uh, doing things in our communities. And if you uh, typically if you have a school where there's one or two teachers who are not performing as they should, I think it's a, the first thing to help these teachers is the kind of a co collective uh, professional community there, rather than that people would wait for an authority or somebody else to come, come and say yeah. what, what to do. So I think this is the first thing we try to do and if it doesn't help them, then some other measures will step into the picture. Pazi Solberg, thank you very much. I think we've heard a tremendous amount about the trust, the cooperation, the collaboration, the way in which the community is involved and I really love the way in which you are able to express it in the, the manner in which you do. We have a tremendous amount to learn. So welcome to Australia. We look forward to having you back. I'll be back Thank here. you for the communication. Thank you, thank you so much.